the strap line has been when people land a rover on Mars, they talk about the eight minutes of terror or whatever <laughs> as it's entering and landing. And it's something like 11 months of terror as they do all of these 350. <laughs> The other big thing, of course, that's going on in astronomy at the moment is is James Webb's coming online. So what what status are we at with that now? So maybe if you could tell us a little bit about what, what James Webb is, is designed to do because it's, it's going to launch relatively soon and why the hell it's taken so long. Because uh, it always seems to be that that one that's that's got sort of six months away. Or, and it, or yeah. it certainly and has always, been probably. since I was doing... What PhD? Yeah, it's been... Twenty years ago, we were talking about yeah. Yeah. launching. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, a lot of things about James Webb. I guess the James Webb is not a survey instrument. It's a point, like it's a small field of view type instrument. It's designed to look primarily in the infrared. That's why the mirrors are gold covered instead of silver, because um, you get better reflection properties in the infrared. It's a bigger telescope than Hubble, but the angular resolution that it will have, like the features, the size of features that it will be able to resolve is fairly similar to Hubble because Hubble was invisible light. It was a smaller telescope, invisible light. This is a bigger telescope, but it's longer wavelength. Right. And so you still have the same diffraction spot. Um, the ratio of the wavelength to the diameter is basically the same. So it's going to be the, it's essentially the successor to Hubble. Is that is that fair yeah. to say? Yeah. And, the, and they want it in the infrared because Hubble's already taken you know, there's we have a lot of information from Hubble on visible, like visible light astronomy. The infrared allows you to see through um, dust more readily. You can't see through all dust, but you can see deep deeper into dust lanes and things like that. Star forming regions. Also, um, when you're talking about cosmology and you're looking at galaxies that are redshifted. So if you have a redshift of two, for example, now all of a sudden what was visible light astronomy to nearby galaxies yeah. turns into infrared astronomy for distant galaxies. Yeah. And so, so you can look, so you can look out further and therefore further back in time, I guess. Yeah. So you'll study the same features, except you'll have the sensitivity to the same features, except at a distance that is yeah. farther away, which implies an earlier stage in the formation of the, yeah. the, the life cycle of the galaxy. So that's what James Webb will do as far as exoplanets are concerned. Um, it will be a really good instrument for studying atmospheres, um, thermal properties of extrasolar planets. Ah, um, because because you can get these IR fingerprints, you can get, right. I guess, the rotational, uh, sorry, the vibrational spectra of the molecules in the atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So when you have molecules in the atmosphere, the floppier the molecules are, the the more infrared signatures they'll have. Mm. So water is fairly floppy. Uh, methane is carbon floppy. dioxide things like this yeah once you get past two two atoms in the molecule then then the infrared signature comes out that's yeah they've got all these nice it. different vibrational modes that you can uh, that you can excite it does, does the hula hoop mode and <laughs> that's basically what that's what a greenhouse gas does right a greenhouse the reason greenhouse gases are what they are is because they can do the hula hoop mode they can there's different vibration states that they have that you don't have with the dumbbell um, with the oxygen and nitrogen that just have two atoms. Ramsey, you worked in, were, were you ever in, in infrared? No, all my stuff was radio. All your stuff was radio. So much on the wavelength, but punches through stuff much better. That's, that's when we can get super, super, super far back. But, yeah. Uh, well, that's how you can see planets that are, <laughs> yeah, I guess this was an x-ray source though. So, um, I suspect it probably has a large radio signature as well though. So, so the second part of this, sorry, Ramsey, were you going to say something then? Yeah, just on the, the tech side of um, uh, the James Webb Telescope, I think one of the reasons it's taken so long as well to launch, not only has there been controversies and delays and overruns and all the usual things, but there's a phenomenal amount of complicated processes involved in the launch, isn't it? I was reading something about how, like... 350 landing... individual points of failure or something silly i read. Yeah, so uh, when they unfold the origami shield, they, it's something like uh, the strap line has been when people land a rover on Mars, they talk about the eight minutes of terror or whatever <laughs> as it's entering and landing. 
And it's something like 11 months of terror as they do all of these 350. Do, have you seen this, Jason? Do you come across uh, this I've, I've watched some animations of, of how it's going to play out. And yeah, the, the heat shield was definitely something. There's other things like just unfolding the telescope in general. Um, so there's a lot of technology. And the challenge that you face with these kinds of instruments can also come down to when you write your specification. As soon as you say as good as you can, then the contractor's like, hey, I can drive a very large train of money through that hole right there. Um, so, but there's also the issue of, well, in the, over the course of the development, we've had what, two recessions? Um, yeah. And it was sucking up all sorts of money. They actually had to switch it so that it had its own line item um, because it was taking up so much money out of the yeah. out of NASA programs. Um, what, what's, the what's the budget now compared to the the budget that was that was probably, slated for it? Probably like a factor of ten more, like five to ten more than it. Was uh, what, uh, what are the what are the absolutes? Uh, I think it's ten billion. I think it was supposed to be okay. one point two billion or something okay. like that. Now, I, I will say one thing that the public should know about these kinds of projects is when there's funding that gets cut to a program. Uh, so this basically comes down to like 2008, they did the omnibus bill that went through and they're like, oh my gosh, we just sliced all of the funding to all these things. Mm. Um, when that happens, everything becomes instantly more expensive because when you take a NASA program and you say, okay, NASA, your budget has now been reduced by 10% or something like that. Mm. That 10% doesn't come out of the air conditioning. It doesn't come out of the personnel. It comes out of the money that gets devoted to different projects. Mm. And so it, now, all of a sudden, you've basically, it might be a 10% reduction to NASA as a whole, but it could be a 70% reduction yeah. to a particular project. Squeeze and so now area, yeah. you're trying yeah. to build something off of, um, with less money to buy the material to build it with. And so now it takes longer to build it. Mm. And so while, while one may think that with these kinds of projects that they're saving money by reducing the budget, what it does is it actually increases the cost of any individual and thing. spreads it out over a longer time. Yeah, period. because had, had they just been like, I mean, there, there's a lot of testing, so it's not like it, they could have immediately shaved off a decade, but pretty close. You could have probably shaved off eight years um, if they had the resources to put into it back in, you know, around 2008 when things were getting off the ground and all of a sudden the budget cuts went into place. So, like, these are economy. You know, economics is not a trivial thing. I, I was think... just frantically googling if it's the most overrunning space program. <laughs> of all time. Galileo, the the Galileo satellite constellation is like well over ten years late um, mm -hmm. in terms of being fully finished. And yeah, I don't know the exact numbers, but they were definitely talking about the James Webb Telescope when I was a student twenty years oh, ago. Yeah. So it's yeah, this very... is, it's been on the radar, and this is one of the things I think that came out of like the we need to make sure with the decadal survey that we have an outside, so they have an outside company that audits the proposals so that they have a, at least a, a second opinion on what's the budget for these um, different missions. I'll tell you one of the most amazing things as well, that Hubble has lasted so long. Like yeah. some of the stuff we chuck up there really lasts a long time. There's Martian rovers that are 10 years older than they're supposed to be. Yeah. And Hubble's sort of, Hubble's kind of in the process of dying, right? I remember seeing things about bits of Hubble. That, yeah, uh, so they're not, they're not going to do another servicing mission. It could last longer, right? They could take up another camera. Um, yeah. They would have a challenge because the shuttle isn't there anymore. And so yeah, yeah. the mission that they would normally use for repairs. Je Jeff Jeff wants some some work, doesn't he, in space? Send Jeff. So, um, but Hubble's, you know, it's certainly had a long run. But part of that is because they were able to... Um, able to go up and service it. They've replaced the camera. <coughs> uh, one of the challenges that, so James Webb will not be refurbished. It, it's got, it'll fly, they'll use it as long as they possibly can. Um, but it, once it's done, there's no, there's no going back because it's going to a much different location. That, it's a Lagrange point, is it from memory? Yeah, is that um, right? L2. So yeah. So yeah we're point. not going to send any service modules out there. <laughs> yeah, <that's>, uh, <laughs> or, um, the how far, how is, far out are we talking with that? Just so people watching can. Oh, about yay far. Um, so it's like completely. So where is, is it? Where is, is L2? I'm trying to think. Around yeah. the, so if like, ah. the sun's here, yeah. we're at one of my fingers and the other two are the Lagrange points. Is that, uh, or there, is it different? No, it's the, it's the inline, it's the inline Lagrange points. 
Um, to the moon. So it's the inland one to the moon. No, it's the one to. It's the Earth Lagrange point. So there are five Lagrange points altogether. I'm, ga- I'm getting two- I'm getting Euler Euler mechanics flashbacks from like years. Right. Two. So there's there's two Lagrange points that are the stable Lagrange points, and those are in the orbit. Hmm. So they're sixty yeah. degrees advanced and sixty degrees retarded from the orbit of the planet. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then there's three Lagrange points that are the unstable Lagrange points. One of them is exactly opposite the planet, um, and then the other two surround the planet. I it has to do with the cube root of the mass of ratio of the thing <laughs> times the semi-major axis, something like that. Um, so what some would the cube root be? So put that would be I'll, I'll, I'll put a little script. cartoon up for people afterwards. I'll, cu- I'll cut yeah, it. I suspect it's probably like a tenth Very of an AU. It's probably like a tenth of an AU, something like that. So um, it's way farther than low Earth orbit, yeah. which is... You're going to need more than a, a box of sandwiches to get there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A, lot of, a lot of toilet paper. Um, well, <laughs> Ramsey was talking about the fact that we keep these things going for a long time. What's the what's the um, the exoplanet mission that's been running for absolutely ages? And it was supposed to run and die, and they kept it going for ages. You'll you'll know the the well, so Kepler Kepler yeah. So that one was supposed to run for four years or like three and a half years, and it lasted for four years in its nominal phase. Then some reaction wheels failed, so that one failed through some mechanical devices, had the reaction wheel remained working, it would have gone for a whole decade mm. without any trouble. It went for nine years, which is basically a whole decade, mm. but it has expendables. It has like thruster fuel that run out. And th- at that point, then they can't control it anymore. Yeah. Um, when, it, when it comes to the infrared missions, like James Webb, it's got a lifetime that's dictated by the coolant. So they're launching up, they have to cool the instrument down because they're looking at long wavelengths, yeah, which yeah, means that yeah. you get signals from all sorts of places that heat, you know, this coolant's boiling away the whole time. And once the coolant boils away, then the instrument heats up and now it's not as sensitive anymore. And, and I'm guessing this is because the photons that are coming in, the IR photons are low energy. So you've got to keep right. that signal to noise ratio incredibly yeah, your low. Noise temperature, your noise temperature has to be below the signal temperature. Yeah. They said, what is it? Kept below 50 Kelvin by this huge heat shield, which is on the back. And and like you say, a load of coolant. So has to be incredibly low interference. And, you, and you'll know this, Ramsey, from working with lots of sensors. If if there's if there's any heat there, any thermal noise, it's going to just swamp the the uh, the infrared photons, which are very low energy coming in. So it has to be kept very, very cold and shielded from other radiation sources, which is why it has this this big set of unfolding mirrors that you can see in the uh, in the picture. So apparently that's why it's got to unfold and it might go wrong at any moment. And uh, and we'll have to see how that goes. And let, let's hope, yes. Yeah. And let, let's hope they get the optics right, uh, which they didn't with Hubble, right? Because oh. as we just discussed, we won't be able to send up. So your audience might not might not have been, some of your audience might not have been born, but the, um, the amazing story where Hubble... Yeah. Um, had a machining fault. Yeah, so I was going to bring this up. It's a really good story. Yeah. Um, when it was first up there, the first images came back. They were horribly blurry. <laughs> um, the team investigated what had happened, figured out in the machining process there'd been a fault, managed to design um, a fix that then the astronauts went up on the shuttle and inserted uh, inside the telescope a pair of corrective lenses in a manner that was never part of the original design and we get beautiful Hubble images. I mean, it's an so amazing. Hubble, Hubble is basically wearing a pair of glasses. Yeah. 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 Monocle. Yeah. Which, which was never in the original design to squeeze in there, make work fit and everything be fine. And they found a way. So mm-hmm. there's yeah, a, it's a fantastic story. There's an awesome documentary about like the making of the mirror for Hubble. And they, when they were grinding the mirror, it had to be so precise that they had to stop if somebody was on the road two miles away with a truck driving across they had to shut it all down the sanding mm. of the mirror because they had to get it so perfect um so yeah very and then they very collaboration and... yeah exactly so very very precise stuff the 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 last thing i wanted to touch on with this and I, I don't know how how deep we want to get into it there's obviously um you know been a lot of controversy about the the naming of it i've seen a lot of people complaining about that jason any thoughts on on that it seems james webb might have had some not not too mm. modern mm. ideas about homosexuals or something well, similar I, so I, I don't can't get inside his mind i don't know everything that was going on i think that if we're looking for well now it will it was a little bit weird that 
they chose the name of the James Webb Space Telescope before it launched. So this was, to my knowledge, this was the first time that NASA had named a mission before it was actually operating. Mm -hmm. Normally what happens is that you take a mission, you launch it, once it works, then you name it. So for example, <clears throat> Hubble was originally called the Space Telescope. So the Space yeah. Telescope Science Institute was built around the Space Telescope. And after it launched, then they called it Hubble. CERTIF was the Space Infrared Telescope Facility that became uh, Spitzer. Um, then you had, I don't know what Compton was before it launched. You had uh, Chandra that also had another name. Fermi, the Fermi telescope was glassed, the gamma ray large aperture space telescope. It was glassed up until it launched and they renamed it Fermi. So when they named this one, James Webb, um, that was a bit unusual. And it was kind of done, as far as I understand it, it was done as a way of like, there's no way that NASA would ever cancel a mission named after James Webb because he was um, you know, instrumental in getting people onto the moon. Um, as far as like, all, all of these people are flawed. Every, there's, there's no person on the planet um, that is that doesn't have flaws of one form or another. And I, I think that waiting for that person to come, you know, then the millennium will be ushered in and we'll, it'll be a different, a different world that we live on. So I, I guess it's always um, difficult when we're looking at people who lived in a different age and, you know, was he typical? Was he atypical of that time? It's all a bit. Well, how many, of, how many of these people are anti, were anti-Semitic? How many people, yeah, yeah. You know, if, if the Israeli. Um, I wouldn't want somebody to look back at sort of my moral qualms in, in 50 years, let's say. And, uh, but we don't know what, thing. we don't know what's going to be viewed, you know, how things are going to be viewed 50 years from now. Some of the things that are happening today, you know, I can't believe that you let, that there was you let so many people live in homeless encampments mm. um like look how terrible these things were eat meat or um, whatever it might be yeah and so i think you know if the israeli symphony orchestra can play wagner um you know i think some uh, some amount of grace is in order for people that don't live up to our standards we, we don't know I, I know that one of the names that was proposed as a replacement uh was like harriet tubman but you know we don't know her opinions about a lot of these things either hmm. the fact that there's less documentation doesn't all of a sudden make the person um a moral superior in one form or another so it, it's unfortunate that um it sort of got wrapped up in a bit of politics right at the end yeah i, I don't know that i i just at some point it's up to us today to be magnanimous Fair enough. The, the, the one thing that you sort of ruined for me on this, Jason, which was a very good comment um, when we were discussing this beforehand, was I was saying we'll get a load more of these beautiful, you know, Hubble deep field pictures that people love to use as their screensavers. But won't they all be in infrared? So black and white, boring, horrible pictures. Uh, they'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll do a pretty good job of false color refining it. <laughs> um, yeah. So if yeah, you yeah, just allocate the frequencies to the sure. colors and crack on, yeah, yeah, there is um, a really just to get a, people a flavor of what's going on. Um, if you do a search for the Eagle Nebula Hubble Space Telescope visible light infrared light, Hubble. there's a side by side. There's a side by side image of the Pillars of Creation, which was a really iconic. I mean, I put it up on my wall when it came out. Yeah, I I've, get, I've got it up. Yeah. Um, and it shows a side by side of here's what it looks like in visible light and here's what it looks like in infrared light. And you can see um, the really the difference. And it's just kind of the beginning of the difference because James Webb will be able to see further into the infrared than Hubble was able to. So and we're still we'll get some still get some sexy pictures then. Yeah, <laughs> it'll it'll be pretty gnarly. I mean they'll they'll boost the colors into the visible range. Um, I have no doubt that the graphic artists will be able to produce something that is quite incredible, incredible. Um, so you can see like the difference between here's what the clouds look like in the visible and they're totally opaque, which yeah. gives some information, right? You, you know what the optical depth is at certain wavelengths, you know, tells you information about it, but then you don't want to just go back and take another picture of the same place unless you can get new information. Uh, and so the new information is what you get at the longer wavelengths and you can see really how different it looks. Um, certain areas are just more exposed. You can see 
uh, deeper into the into the features. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.